I finally made it. My traineeship was starting. I got a job in a top firm in Melbourne. My future could not be more secure. So I thought. My traineeship was a whole year and I thought law school was competitive. My traineeship was even more competitive. My traineeship would go for a year and required us to go through three different departments in the firm. Departments like commercial law, workplace safety, construction, property. And we also had to study at the College of Law. Once we met both the work experience criteria and our study component, then would be ready to be admitted by the Supreme Court of Victoria. Being admitted by the Supreme Court of Victoria meant that I, Rugare Rashe Gomo, would be a solicitor, an Australian qualified solicitor. My traineeship was highly competitive. Everything about me was being analyzed. How much money did I bring to the firm? What clothes did I wear? How did I do my hair? Whether I was connecting with the partners and the other lawyers, whether clients liked me or didn't like me, how many case notes and case studies I was presenting or creating for the firm, and many more. I was under the microscope all the time. The part of the traineeship that was really high pressure was choosing the department you were going to go to after you finished your traineeship. During my traineeship, I rotated through three departments. All the trainees did. I rotated through commercial department, the construction department, and the property department. Now, in my year, the commercial department was very popular. Going to the commercial department was like going to Switzerland and living there forever because you spend the rest of your life doing that. The property department was not popular. It was like going to North Korea and spending the rest of your life in North Korea. The reason why this was bad was that the senior partners at that time would play favorites. There were the in crowd and the out crowd. Uh, the people who were in the in crowd would get opportunities the ones who are not in the in crowd would not get opportunities. And um, as a lawyer, whether you are a graduate, even a senior associate, you are constantly made to feel worthless. It just had a bad reputation. At the firm, some people did know I was gay. Not everybody did know I was gay. So I was flying under the radar. If I was to go to the commercial group, then all the partners would definitely know that I was gay. And I didn't know how that was going to impact my opportunities and my career progress in that department. So instead of going after what I wanted, like I normally did, I chose my second preference and put my second preference to the top, which was the property group. As I said, going to the property group was like going to North Korea. However, I thought I could handle it. Up until this point, I've always gone for the best. I went to an amazing law school. I came to an extraordinary country. I've created amazing internships for myself around the world. I always strived for my best. This time, I didn't go after the best. For me, I remember sitting at my desk and I had to type out my preferences. I had to give them my top three. I put number one, commercial, number two, property, number three, construction. I look and stare at the screen. I say to myself, I can't do this. My sexuality is going to be in the way. I'm going to be found out by the commercial group to be gay and they're going to take away opportunities for me. Now, I didn't know if this was going to happen in reality. In fact, 
I don't believe this was going to happen in reality. I was loved in the firm. But in my head, that was my reality. I stared at the screen again. I start pressing the delete button to number one. As I delete the best opportunity for myself. And type out property. And put commercial second. Then I pressed send and the email went off to HR. And that triggered a different adventure for my life. Up until this point, I've always gone for the best. A few weeks later, I get my email and I am told which department I'm going to be going to. I got into my first preference property. I'm off to North Korea. I successfully completed my traineeship at Maddox and I got admitted to practice as a solicitor in the Supreme Court of Victoria and the High Court of Australia. I was beyond excited. I, Rugare Gomo from Zimbabwe, the small city Mutare, was an Australian qualified solicitor. My possibilities and opportunities would now be endless. I remember writing my name in this book. In this book, all the lawyers in Victoria before me had written their name too. And I, Rugare Rwashe Gomo from Zimbabwe, was going to be writing my name in this big book, which was kept sacred at the Supreme Court of Victoria. I remember in that moment, I remember everything I'd been through for this opportunity, this opportunity that should never have been possible for me. Writing the letter to Andrew, getting my first student visa to come to Australia, raising over $120,000 as a teenager to get through my university, overcoming a serious illness, coming out to my family, and being able to get a visa a work visa to stay and take on my traineeship so that for this moment, I can become an Australian qualified lawyer. So many people had backed me for this opportunity. From Zimbabwe, my mom, my dad, in Australia, Andrew, Janine, Sharon, my school community, my university community, the people at McDonald's, the people at Maddox, Strangers who I came across in my life who heard my story. Hundreds of people had contributed for me for this moment. My life is not my own. My life is the community's. This victory was not just a personal victory. This victory was for my grandmother who was denied an education. This victory was for my mom and my dad who never went to university. This victory was for all my cousins who had remained in Zimbabwe, who themselves had never got an opportunity. I was representing a whole community, Zimbabwe. I was on a high when I got accepted as an Australian qualified lawyer. My communities in Australia were happy for me. My family in Zimbabwe were happy for me. I was happy for me. I felt that no matter what obstacle was thrown at me, I could overcome it. I got into the property group. The property group had a bad reputation in the firm, but I thought I could handle it. After all, I've overcome so many obstacles. What could go wrong in this group? Now, when I started practicing as a property lawyer, I discovered that it was very, very clicky. 
there was an in-group and an out-group. If you're part of the in-group, you'd be taken out to lunch with the partners. You'd get high quality work given to you. You were praised and celebrated for the, your achievements. If you're part of the out-group, you were not going out for lunch with the partners. You'd work very, very hard with very little praise. And mostly, everything that you did wrong was pointed out to you constantly. I was part of the out group. Why did an in and out group exist? That is just where it was. Now, you must note, many of the top firms in Australia the people who work in them come from private schools, very wealthy families. They keep the tradition, spoiled, never had to overcome any challenges. So why not? They can act badly. What's going to happen? I was in the out group and this meant I was losing my community. Community was something that had me be the person I am today. Community was what had me come to Australia. Community was what had me raise over $120,000. Community is what had me get my opportunity to go to law school. In the property group, I had no community. I was alone. My whole life, I'd been a hard worker. Whenever there was an opportunity for me to seize, I worked hard. For that opportunity. I took the actions to get those opportunities and for those opportunities to materialize. I work hard. In the property group, no matter how hard I worked, the opportunities were not coming my way. The opportunity to meet with the clients were not coming my way. The opportunity for that precious one-on-one -on -one time with the senior partners of the property group were not coming my way. I was completely stuck. In my life journey, I had discovered authenticity. In fact, Jess and I had made a pact that as gay people, we would not take drugs, we would not kill ourselves, and that we were going to be the best role models for other gay people, which led us to our journey of coming out to our family, our friends, our community. Being myself was important. Being authentic was what also allowed me to heal when I was terribly sick. In the property group, I couldn't be authentic. I wasn't allowed to be myself. I shut down. I was completely suppressed. There was no room for authenticity. When all of these things were happening to me, not having a community, not having opportunity no matter how hard I worked, not being allowed to be myself and be authentic, I doubted myself. I thought there was something wrong with me that had this show up. In fact, I was so sure it was because I was gay. This was my worst fear. I was always scared that being gay was going to impact my career opportunities. In my head, the only rationale I could think about for not progressing and not having opportunity was because of my sexuality, being a gay man. What was happening to me was not personal. This was happening to many other people in the property group. In fact, even some of my friends in other firms were experiencing the same thing. We just all accepted that this was just how things were. Looking back, 
I now know that this is bullying. In that moment, I did not know it was bullying. Because I didn't know that I was being bullied, I began to doubt myself. I really thought that this was happening to me because I was gay. I would go every day into work with a sense of dread. It became very hard waking up in the morning to go to work because I knew at some point in the day, somebody was going to point out how bad I was as a lawyer, how wrong I was as a lawyer. Each day, my self-worth was being chipped away and being taken away from me, one piece at a time. I felt completely stuck. I was made to feel absolutely worthless, but I felt that I could not leave. I was still waiting for my permanent residence visa to come out. So I thought that no other company was going to employ me because I didn't have a permanent visa to stay in Australia yet. It was also just after the global financial crisis. So there were very limited opportunities anyway. So I thought nobody was going to take me because I was a young lawyer with very little experience. In addition, I was earning more money than I'd ever earned before. And so it was an opportunity to start saving money for my sister's education. I felt stuck. I felt I couldn't leave. However, I had to pretend that I had it all together. After all, we had invested so much time and money for me to have this opportunity to become an Australian qualified lawyer. I'd left my family now for nine years. We had invested over $120,000 into my university fees. And I had overcome so many obstacles and so many people had contributed for me to arrive at this opportunity. I felt I could not disappoint the people who had helped me arrive here. I had to stay, but it made me miserable, sad, and looking back, I now know that I was depressed. This experience was not just personal to me. Many, many lawyers were going through exactly what I was going through. How they coped with it was by taking drugs, heroin, cocaine, excessive drinking of alcohol. How I coped with it was I used sex to escape my reality. It was very unhealthy. To cope with being alone and miserable, I abused sex. And what made this worse was that I now had money to facilitate my habits. What this looked like was that I'd spend countless of hours on apps to look to hook up with men. I would fly to Sydney from time to time to hook up with men. I would insert myself in other gay people's relationships as well. During all this time, I'm not being connected and there's no love present. I feel worse about myself. What I wanted was connection. I didn't get that at all. In fact, I just felt more alone. In the law firm, Nobody really knows what's going on for the next person. Everybody is wearing their posh suits, power suits, um, perfectly groomed hair, polished shoes, and everybody seems well put together. There is no inch of vulnerability. Any inch of vulnerability was going to be used against you. So nobody knew what I was dealing with. I didn't really know what my other colleagues were dealing with. After spending two years in North Korea, I'm in the property group, 
I had the courage to leave. It wasn't just one thing that had me have the courage. There were several things that together gave me the courage to take the next action for freedom. One of these actions was that I remember being in a meeting, a huge construction dispute meeting, and the parties hated each other. I had worked so hard on the advice, and in the meeting, none of the parties cared about the advice. They just hated each other, so they wanted to take the matter to court and fight their anger there. In that moment, I thought to myself, what am I doing? I'm wasting my life. I'm spending so much time creating some amazing advice which could make a difference to a company and their entire team. Yet, because of this anger, this was going to get in the way of an amicable solution. I remember feeling that I was wasting my life and that I could be a better business person. I joined Maddox when I was 19 years old. And since then, there were some people who were really instrumental in um, my development and mentoring me. One of these was a very senior lawyer in the property department. He would take me out for lunch from time to time, pay for my lunch because he knew of my personal circumstances that I couldn't afford it. He really was in tune with the challenges I was facing in my life. I'm forever grateful to him. I remember him always bringing up this conversation. Rogare, do not stay in the law firm for too long. They are beasts. Don't be like me. I'm trapped. I kept on getting paid more money. Now I've got a mortgage and I've got all these responsibilities and I don't feel I can leave. Don't do that. Get the training and leave. He would say this to me on a regular basis. I would listen, kind of take it in, but not really take him seriously. Only after two years in the property group did I realize exactly what he was talking about. Because now I was feeling like him, stuck and trapped. One of the things that had me have the courage to finally leave was when I had my performance review. In my performance review, because of the global financial crisis, there had been a pay freeze in the firm for about two years. In my performance review, the partners in the property group had decided not to give me a pay rise in line with the other people at my year level, while the rest of the people in my year level were going to be getting $80,000. I was only going to be getting $70,000. And they justified this because my performance was bad. Yes, my performance was bad. I admit it. I could barely wake up in the morning to go to work. Writing the briefs were a struggle. But in that moment, I had this realization my performance was bad because the environment I was in was toxic. It just wasn't all my fault. This was an impetus for me to leave this toxic environment, find my way out of North Korea, and find my way to Switzerland, a firm with a great environment that would allow me to thrive. I knew I could thrive after everything I had accomplished and after all the obstacles I had overcome, coming to Australia, getting a visa, completing my law degree, I could do this. Another thing that inspired me to have the courage to live was my volunteer role. I had been volunteering with the Asylum Seeker Resource Center as a volunteer solicitor for about two years. And I was helping applicants apply for asylum. And the applicants typically came from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, 
Zimbabwe. I focused on helping people from the African continent and the French speaking communities. I loved what I did and it was heartbreaking. Every week I'd hear the stories of a Nigerian who had fled the country because he was going to be killed for the practice of their faith. I heard of people from my own home country who had fled because they had witnessed their family being killed. The stories were life and death stories. Using my best mind and skills for them to get asylum was critical. There was no room for error. If they did not get their asylum and share their story with me so that they could get their asylum, they could be in detention indefinitely. And that was going to be on me. So I bloody worked hard on all those asylum cases as a volunteer solicitor. Now, as I was working on their applications, I also got present to my own circumstances at work. I was tolerating being in a prison. They were not. I summoned the courage to take a new action, to free myself, just like they had taken actions to free themselves. Up until this point, I was still waiting to receive my Australian permanent residency. I had been waiting for two years. I remember when I was in the office, my phone rang. I picked it up. A lady introduced herself and she was from the Department of Immigration. Immediately I thought, oh no, what have I done wrong? She explained to me that they were ready to process my permanent residency. There had been a change in um, the skills list, the, the skills that were in high demand and solicitors had been put back on the skills in high demand, which meant that they were going to fast track my application. And she wanted me to do a health test as well and a police check again. Once this came back successfully, they would then be able to grant me my permanent residency. I was so excited. The time had arrived for my Australian permanent residency. That would mean that I could stay in Australia forever. It would mean that I could take on any opportunities in Australia. The numerous opportunities that are available in Australia. On the 16th of August, 2011, my permanent residency was granted. I remember how I felt. I felt finally free. After that, I finally made the decision to leave Maddox. That was a scary decision for me. I loved the firm Maddox generally. I'd been working there since I was 19 years old. So I had been there for about seven years. I'd been there in the mail room, the document management, debt collecting, a paralegal, a trainee, and now a lawyer. And now I was ending a chapter of my life and starting a brand new chapter. I also want to acknowledge that while I was at Maddox, I did have a support community. After all, before I practiced as a lawyer, I had already been working there for five years. In particular, the women at Maddox made a life changing contribution to me. From Paula in the president department, who taught me how to do all document management for an entire firm. Sue Siemens, who was the leader of the debt recovery department, who gave me employment, trained me on how to be on the phones and um, developed me. To Jeanette, the head of library, 
who helped me with research so that I could be a better analyst to provide to all the other lawyers. I could go on and on and on. My community were the secretaries, the PAs, the support staff, the librarians, all of them, and the particularly women, would always check on me to ensure that I was nurtured, I was taken care of, and I knew to go to the next opportunity. Every single one of those women made a significant difference in my life. They are the nobodies, the unseen faces in the organizations. They would check in to make sure that I had sufficient food. They knew I was doing crazy hours at university and trying to save money for my next opportunity. They would check in on me and give me the little tips of gossip around the firm so that I could strategically position myself for the next opportunity at Maddox. These women loved me and I loved them. I'm so grateful to them.